Why can't God just come down and fix this messed up situation? Why can't he just come down and solve all of these nasty problems in our world? This is a common lament of God's people. We find it in many places in the Bible, such as our Old Testament reading today. The prophet Isaiah is voicing this lament. In chapter 64, it begins with, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries and that the nations might tremble at your presence. We want God to come down in might and make things right. Have you ever voiced a prayer like this to God? A prayer where He can just come and fix a situation that's beyond your control? Or a situation that you feel is unjust? Where the unrighteous are triumphing over the righteous? Where sin seems to be the victor? and not our God. Maybe you prayed this prayer after the unexpected or tragic death of a loved one. Maybe you prayed it because of the terrible state of the world, and you just feel like things are falling apart. Or maybe it's because you feel like those who have done wickedness to you seem to get all of the blessings. Their lives seem to go so well. Well, dear friends in Christ, you aren't alone in this prayer. This is a common refrain from God's people. Now, you may be unfamiliar with it, or you may feel like it's not even a prayer. You may feel like it's a complaint. But the actual word for it is a lament. We have a book of the Bible called Lamentations, which is a good example of this sort of prayer. But there's also a number of psalms that lament. How long, O Lord? Will you not listen to my cries? Where are you at in my situation? But a lament is not simply a complaint. It's an expression of anguish. And it's mostly an expression of anguish at the absence of God, where you think He should be present. And here, as we begin the new church year, we enter into Advent, a season of waiting. And like Isaiah, we are waiting for the answer to our lament as God's people. Where are you, O Lord? Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Now, as we read Isaiah 64, we're transported back to a time when God's people are in exile. They've been conquered by the Babylonians, and they're in anguish. Their homeland has been taken from them. They cannot worship God as they did in the temple. And it certainly seems like the people of God have been abandoned, that God seems absent where He should be present. And here His prophet sent to His people voices these laments to God. Well, the season of Advent is meant to evoke this kind of reflection, this kind of lament, and this kind of waiting, an examination of the state of ourselves and the world due to what we perceive to be the absence of God. However, even not in Advent, we can relate to the expression of anguish, of anger and sadness that we hear in this lament to God. The anger and sadness that we feel when it seems like God is so far away when He should be so present. But as we go through Isaiah 64 this morning, we'll see a progression, I think a progression that will help us as we enter into a season of waiting and reflection to the answer to our lament, our prayer. Now, this lament actually 
uh, begins in the chapter before, Isaiah 63, verse 7, and it begins like most laments do with a praising of God and acknowledging the mighty acts of deliverance that He has done for His people. Most often in the Old Testament, this references, of course, the exodus from Egypt, and the lament usually starts with referencing this great act of deliverance where God came in power and delivered His people from their anguish. Then comes the question, after the praising of this mighty and powerful God who intercedes for His people and saves them, the God who did all these things, where did you go? Where are you now? And that's where we arrive today in our verses in chapter 64. The praises of God have been stated, His mighty acts of deliverance and salvation have been praised, and then the question, where are you now? Now, Isaiah starts out this petition part of the lament by saying and asking for God to come and come in might so that the enemies of his people and his own enemies know who he is, that he is there, and that they tremble at his presence. I don't know about you, but I've prayed that prayer before. Well, basically, it's a prayer for God to give those people what they deserve, right? Because the bad's always out there. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. The country is falling apart. The wicked thrive. Problems out there. Why don't you come down and show them the truth? And in the Old Testament, this would be an unmistakable act. The, the arrival of God in this manner always is accompanied by natural upheaval, fires, earthquakes, mountains trembling. You'd know it was Him. And that's the prayer, make yourself known. You've done this in the past, you came as a pillar of fire and blocked the army of Pharaoh. You sent your angel of death to kill all the firstborn of our mighty and powerful enemies so that we left plundering victors when we left Egypt. And when all hope seemed lost, you came down and split the ocean in two so we could walk through on dry ground. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, just like you did then. No other God has been seen or heard besides you, who acts on behalf of your people who wait for you. This part of the prayer really focuses on two desires. One, that he would come and rescue me. Come and rescue and vindicate your people, O God. And the second is, come in might and destroy those unrighteous adversaries, those people who are your enemies. So we get to verse 5, the beginning of verse 5, that we, we find out that He meets those joyfully who do His work in righteousness. But this leads us to the question, who are the unrighteous adversaries of God? Well, at verse 5, there's quite a shift in the prayer. The second part of the verse shifts from the focus being on God making Himself known and instead turns to the person doing the praying in repentance and confession. Behold! It begins, this part of verse 5, which is a signifier that always is saying, take note, something unknown is being made known. You were angry and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? See, behold, contrast the first and second part of verse 5. God meets him who joyfully works righteousness and remembers him in his ways, But behold, God's people are not righteous. They have not remembered Him in His ways. And the tone of the prayer changes because it turns out 
The unrighteous adversaries of God aren't just out there in the world that made themselves obvious enemies of God or where you feel like things are falling apart. It turns out that the unrighteous adversaries include God's own people who've sinned against Him, who followed after other gods. If you spend any time in the Old Testament, you know it's basically a, it's one basic cycle. God comes to His people and makes a promise with them to be their God and blesses them. And it's good for a little while, but then a few generations down the line, they forget God and His promises, and they forget to worship Him because things don't seem that great or they fail to keep their promises to Him. They fall away, they worship other gods, which the Old Testament describes as a betrayal of God akin to adultery, their idolatry after other gods. And then in mercy, He comes to them again, and they begin anew. And that cycle just continues all the way until Christ is born. And Isaiah voices this reality by saying that they have become like one who is unclean, and their righteous deeds have become a polluted garment. See, during Advent, we pray for our God to come down and deliver us. So we too are struck by the word, behold. We too ought to realize that we are not among the righteous, that we have not always remembered His ways. That's why each service here on Sunday morning begins with repentance and confession of sin. And if that isn't enough, verse 6 and 7 emphasize this truth about God's people even more. No one calls upon God's name. He has hidden His face from us, and He has given us over to the consequences of our sins. We reap what we sow. And it turns out that's not good news for us. So what becomes of a people who call down on their God to come and vindicate the righteous and destroy the enemies of God only to find out there's no righteous to vindicate and that they themselves are those adversaries? Well, lament typically ends the same way that Isaiah ends this one. And all we can do is the same as he does. We plead for God to be faithful to an unfaithful people, to remember us, his people, in mercy, in the mercy that he promised. So in verse 8, Isaiah shifts the focus away from the unrighteous and unclean people and back to God himself. But he's no longer asking God to come down in might. Hear what he says. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. You are the Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are the work of your hand. Isaiah humbles himself. The people of God humble themselves and appeal to God's mercy. If you go back and look at our confession of sins, it was a very similar thing. We just appeal to God's mercy. We appeal to His grace, His faithfulness, that He will remember the promises that He has made to His people despite our unworthiness. We ask Him not to look at us in anger and remember not our sins forever. And once again, we get that word, behold, take note. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, We are your people. So this Advent, we join in Isaiah's prayer. I think it's a good way to begin a season of waiting, of reflection, repentance, confession, ending in hope. 
We pray that God would come down to deliver His people and make Himself known to His enemies. That is a good thing to pray. And through praying that, we realize that we are one of those enemies. We realize that we have sinned. We didn't remember Him in His ways, but instead went our own way. And we plead for God to remember His promises to us and look at us in mercy. Have good news. God has and will answer your prayer. He does come down. This is the tension and joy of being the church today. We know that Christ has come. We know that prayer was answered. Although it's very true in verse um, 3. The incarnation of Christ is indeed an awesome thing that we did not look for. I'm sure when Isaiah was praying this prayer, he wasn't imagining a babe born in Bethlehem. That doesn't sound much like, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down in might. And yet, the weakness of God is greater than anything in this world. And He did come down. He came down for you. Our Savior comes, but in the might of mercy. He heard the prayer of His people, the pleas and their cries, just like He did in Egypt. He hears your pleas today. And He remembers not your iniquity, but comes in mercy and faithfulness to save an unfaithful people, and to make them His own. Behold, our Savior comes, and He comes in mercy, and He remembers not your sins. Lord, have mercy on us. Come, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen.